I thought you were meeting with Josh. I, I think you're right. We'll see how this goes. Well, our our video feed should go fine, though, wouldn't you think? Or is it just the live feed that's hung up? I'm 100% confident in Sam. Here we go, green light, he says. Looks good. As you may have seen some other things going on the in the world today that uh, are maybe uh, requiring a bit of live streaming otherwise, uh, aside from tying flies, which I don't know, there's priorities. Um, so at any rate, we're going to start in tonight and, and, and uh, tie a few flies. I've got some uh, videos to show you all. And uh, like last time, uh, uh, also, in between each fly, we'll have a little break in between each fly, and hopefully our, our live feed video holds up. Um, the, uh, the live feed's a little bit in question right now about how far how far along it's going to hold up, but uh, uh, should come through. You still got me here. Uh, the mole fly and the Charlie Boy Hopper. So, um, say the flies again. Okay, we're going to do the Juju Bee first. Uh, and hopefully, this is coming through better on your end than it looks like it is on my end. Um, but we're going to. Let's just go ahead and get to that and see if our feed does get better. And uh, we'll try to try to make this work. So here's my jujube image. This is a uh, pattern.
All right, this next fly is going to be the Jujube Midge. This is a uh, Colorado Midge pattern I came up with probably around 20 some years ago. Uh, I named it after my daughter, Julie. Uh, that Jujube is her nickname. And uh, this is a, a cool little midge pattern that I came up with on the South Platte up in Cheeseman Canyon to match the midges up there. It's a fairly simple fly. Uh, it's got a few little tricks working with the super hair. It's one of my very first commer commercial patterns available through Umpqua Feather Merchants. Um, it's been commercially available for probably 15 years now. And it's tied on a Tiemco 2488. I'm going to tie a size 16 for you um, because it shows up better on the camera. But typical size range on this fly is 18 through 22. And I'm going to start off with, this is Tiemco 16 aught white thread. You can't get this thread anymore. They don't make it. So the closest thing you can find would probably be uh, Vivas 14 knot. And what you're looking for is something that will lay very flat and is as small as you can get it so we maintain a smooth, sl slim body. So I'm going to start this thread about two eye lengths behind the hook eye. And I'm going to make a thread base, keeping that thread as flat and smooth as I can, down about halfway down the bend. And you can see I'm just sort of tucking those wraps one next to the other, and then I'll come forward again so that we've got that nice and smooth. Now this one that I'm going to tie today is going to be the chartreuse version, which is two strands of chartreuse super hair and one strand of black. So what I'm going to try to do is get these three strands even. You can see them here. And look, super hair always has, has got that little kink in it. So I'm going to take that and just give that a bit of a stretch, slide my fingers down it. That'll take some of that wave out, makes the material easier to work with. And then I'll cut the three ends so that they're all square. I'm going to take these, these three strands, and what I usually do to catch these is kind of hold them close to the end and angle them down on my near side of the hook. And then I can sneak my thread over them. And I'll usually get a couple of turns there, sort of in a little narrow band. Then I can draw these down to length. And what I'm doing is tying these down on my near side of the hook. And I just pull those butt ends down to where they're almost flush with the thread wrap. You've got to be careful there. If you pull it out, you get to do it again. So now I'm going to start to wrap back over this. And I want to maintain my thread and keep it flat. So I may need to stop and spin it occasionally. If you tie right-handed, you'll probably need to stop and spin it a little more often. I'm going to come about halfway down the bend, and again, you can see I'm keeping that thread as flat and smooth as I can. And then I'll just come straight forward again. Right back up to the front. So now I'm going to take my three strands. I usually cut these three strands so that they're all the same length. It just makes it a little easier to maintain uh, a hold on all three of them at the same time. And we're going to start to build the body. Now the way these have lined up is uh, chartreuse, chartreuse, black, going from bottom to top there. Um, it really doesn't make any difference how they line up exactly. I used to really sweat it, but the only place it shows that they're, they're any different is on the very first turn. From there they line up with chartreuse, chartreuse, black, all the way up the rest of the hook. So I don't really worry about that too much anymore. But what I'm going to do to start this body is I'm going to come around the hook bend. I'm going to reach around the hook point here and then come back again. So this move where I come back again is important. Now as I come up here, this part's important too. What I want to do is I want to pull those three strands of super hair straight up, okay, straight vertical. And you can kind of rock them back and forth so that they sit next to each other. Um, if you wrap perpendicular to the hook at this angle, as you approach the apex of the hook bend here, these three fibers will want to separate and you'll get spaces in the body. So what I've got to do is I've got to keep this first wrap darn near upright and I'll kind of rock it back and forth to place that first turn in place. I'm going to come around the hook point, tuck those back in, and butt the next turn right in front of it. Um, I'll try to keep my fingers a little more out of the way here. As I work forward, you can see as I come to the hook point, I've got to reach around the hook point and then come back again. If at any point you get any overlap, just sort of rock these fibers back and forth and they'll lay a little flatter. And then once I'm past the hook point, this is just like wrapping the wire on a brass. You can see I'm slightly angling these back to let them rock flat. 
down against the hook creating this nicely ribbed body and when I get to the front I'll change hands tie that off with three or four good tight turns and I'll follow it up with a few and I'll come in and cut those three strands out now I'm going to come in and whip finish my white thread and I'll trim that out then I'm going to start 8 dot black thread just in front of that tie off and I'll overlap right up onto it as I attach that thread trim my tag out and now for the wing case I'm going to use a dozen strands of white floral fiber um, and again this is on a size 16 so this is a big one you get down on a 20 or 22 you might only use 8 or 10 so I've cut the ends of those square I'm going to catch them on top and draw them down to length. And by length, I just mean that those butt ends are behind, about an eye length behind the hook eye. Then I'll anchor them in place with a few turns. And then I can come forward over those butts. Now what I want to do here is sort of start to build the thorax. And the reason I've switched to dot thread here is because it does build faster. I want the build for the thorax. I don't really want the extra bulk in the abdomen. dot thread is sort of round in cross section so it stacks up well when I'm trying to build a shape like this you can see I've got sort of an egg shape and I've got about a half an eye length or an eye length worth of relatively bare space there behind the hook eye so we've got a clear area to tie off now I'm going to pull my floral fiber up over the top and I'll drape my thread over it and you can see I'll sort of exaggerate that there my, my floral fiber is holding the thread up and I'll pull straight down on the thread to center that wing case across the top of the fly so it's right square over the top. I've got a couple turns on there and then I'm going to take six of these strands of floral fiber on my near side and the other six and you can see I'll sort of roll these in my fingers just sort of twist them up in my fingers and that binds them into two individual strands. That's going to make the flies, the flies as I go on a little easier. I won't have to divide each bunch. They'll kind of stay separated on their own. So now the wing buds, these are tied like legs on a pheasant tail. Uh, but they're actually actually the wing buds of the midge. So this is a midge pupa. I'm going to pull this near bunch of floral fiber back along the side of the hook and just slightly under it. And I'm going to wrap back over it with a couple turns of thread. My thread torque will pull those floral fibers right in line with the side of the hook shank. Now on the far side, my thread torque is going to pull them down. So I want to hold them just up a bit and let the thread torque pull them down into place. So they're right along the sides of the hook. Just a few turns to sort of cover that up. Now one thing on this slide is I do make a prominent thread head because the head is part of the actual insect. It's not just part of the fly. So I'm going to make a little bit oversized head here. You know, midge does not end with its thorax. It's got a little head in front of that. So it's easy enough to do and it matches up nicely. Now to trim these wing buds, I'll grab both bunches set my scissors right against the back edge of the wing case and square them up and then trim those off kind of push them back down in line and that is a chartreuse jujube um, one of my most most popular flies certainly for years and years now um, it's a great fish catcher it's a uh, gosh it's popular all over the country any place there's midges which is everywhere um, this is obviously the chartreuse in black version red and white uh, black and white, olive and black, purple and blue, brown and white. Uh, colors are endless. Color combinations are endless. Uh, uh, it, you know, get you a few packs of, of super hair and kind of go to work. Uh, I've had one package of brown super hair for that entire time that I've been tying jujubes and jujubetus. Um, you know, that entire 20 years, and I've tied a lot of them. So the material lasts forever. You can get six or seven uh, size 20s out of out of three strands. Uh, so it lasts a long time. It's a pretty cheap fly to tie. Um, great way to fill your box and have a good cross-section of a bunch of different midge pupa patterns uh, in different colors and sizes. Uh, that is a jujube midge. I hope you love it as much as I do. All right, I think we're back. 
and it sounds like our video feed is maybe a little bit better now, maybe just slightly. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'm trying to keep up with the uh, uh, the questions here on Instagram, so just keep keep feeding them through there. Uh, it looks like there's a actually it looks a little bit better now. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll keep rolling along and. Uh, is the three nymph rig where do you like in a three nymph rig typically when i fish this fly on it if i have it on a three nymph rig i'll have it on the bottom uh, it's the last little fly you know something like a two bit two bit midge or two bit hooker in front of it and uh, a jujube on the on the bottom it's uh, typically my last fly uh to be perfectly honest with you when fish are eating midges i'll usually just fish two jujubes um just two of them you know 12 15 inches apart um 5x or 6x and i never fish 7x um but that's that's my typical midge rig um favorite fly box for holding the jujube midges my favorite fly box for holding jujube midges or any nymphs are uh, the the little wheatley boxes um you know they're flat foam they hold a ton of flies um some guys really like the magnetic boxes for the little tiny stuff uh but i i like the uh, uh the flat foam which just kind of keeps things a little bit more organized i'm kind of a type a guy so um that's that's where i go and that's i've done that for a for a long time i'm the uh uh, Uncle's got that magneto box that uh, would work wonderfully for these as well. Um, I just don't want to transfer the 300 jujus I've got in a Wheatley box now into one of those. So uh, there we go. Um, dry dropper rig. Um, yeah, you can use it in a dry dropper rig. It's not a uh, it's not a weighted fly. So you know, if I was going to fish a, a midge on a dropper, I'd probably use my my uh, two bit midge there. Um, and yeah, the body is just super hair and. What do I prefer as a dry on the dry dropper rig? Uh, we're actually going to tie that one tonight, the Charlie Boy Hopper. Um, that's typically what I fish for a, uh, a dry in my dry dropper rigs. Um, and we've got a, a new version coming out for 2022 uh, called the Boy Wonder Hopper. Um, that's sort of an amped up version, Charlie Boy 2.0. Uh, that's even better. Um, uh, let's see, we've got another question coming in. Uh, does the Dyna King Vice hold hook sizes 6 through 10 well? Uh, yes, it does very well. That's a that's a, a perfect uh, uh, range on that vice. Uh, six through ten is no problem at all for that vice. That vice actually, the Dyna King vice is old. Um, you know, honestly, I've tied eight dot down to twenty eight in it. I uh, just tied some twenty eights the other day, so um, holds a pretty wide pretty wide range of hooks and holds them really well. Um, do I use the rotary function of the vice very often? I do not. Um, you know, my vice is a conventional vice. Um, I learned to tie on a conventional vise, so I don't. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not used to to using the vise to wrap the material, uh, so I I, uh, I I use my fingers to wrap the material. So I, I don't usually use the rotary version. Um, I do have a Dyna King Barracuda sitting over here just to my right, and uh, um, I do use that on big steelhead stuff. But uh, for the most part, um, I use a conventional vise 99.99999% of the time. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, I missed a few here on Insta. We'll get into our next our next video here before it gets too far along. Uh, dry on the dry dropper. Okay, I think I got them. Uh, Going to get to a hopper. The next slide we're going to do is actually a, a, a juju merge. I think it was the one on our list. Um, a slide ago. Oh, we might have lost ourselves here. That helps. That helps. Let's do. Hey everybody, we're going to tie a Juju Emerger today. Uh, this is a little Mayfly Emerger pattern. I'm going to tie an olive uh, olive brown colored version, and it's tied on a Timco 101. And I'm going to we're tying a size 18 today. Uh, I'm going to start with some. This is uh, dark brown 16 knot Vivas. 14 knot works fine. I still have lots of the 16 knot and it's in my all, all my bags, so that's what I use. And I'm gonna start this thread a couple eye lengths back from the hook eye and just trim that tag end out. 
and I'll bring a thread base all the way back to the bend of the hook and that's where I'm going to tie my tails in. So I'm going to use mayfly tails, you know, tailing fibers, micro fibbits, etc. Uh, whatever brand name you like. I'm going to take two of these and these are pretty fine little filaments. I'm going to grab two of them and cut them out of the clump. And one thing I like to do is make sure that their tips are even. Um, and those look pretty, pretty even. Let me give them a little better eyeball here. There we go. So I've got these two the same length. I'm going to measure them about a shank length, maybe just a skosh longer. Butt them together in my fingers and uh, this is the same trick that I used to tie on an RS2 tail. I'm going to hold the tips, that's what's in my fingertips there, um, and that's my material hand. From the back of the vise, um, I'm pointing the butt ends at my uh, opposite shoulder. So I'm holding these in my right hand and pointing the butt ends at my left shoulder. Um, now keep in mind, I tie left-handed, so if you're right-handed, you'll be doing that opposite. But I'm angling these across the top of the hook. You can see the butt ends here coming away from, from the hook. And I'm going to bring the thread over them and let that roll them to the top. And I'll get a couple turns there, just one in front of the other. And then I'll lift the tails so they're tied in at the bend there. Um, and I usually go just two, three turns forward. Then I'll use my thumbnail to kind of lift and separate those two tails, like so. And now to further separate them, um, you could use a tag end of the thread. Um, and pull that up up between sort of like I've done on the RS2 in my uh, basic tying book um, But what I want to do here is I'm going to show you a figure eight maneuver So my thread is hanging up here toward the hook point. It's about three turns in front of the tie down And I'm going to come back and come up under the near tail and down around the hook And I'm not really pulling terribly hard here. I'm going to kind of let off the tension there and then come over the far tail so let me turn this just a bit and you can follow that path of that thread so I just made a figure eight, and as I tighten that, you can see that'll separate the tails. Uh, so I want to do that where I can see it a little better. Get a couple turns on there, and now I've got a nice widely spread tail. So that figure eight turn of thread there. I'm going to bring my thread forward over the butt ends. I don't want to cut the butt ends off early because I want to use them to help build the underbody. I do want to keep them square on the hook right up to where I started and I can trim those tails out. Now in the case of the olive brown version I'm going to take two strands of olive super hair. This is a juju emerger so of course it's got super hair in it. I'm going to take two strands of the olive super hair and one strand of brown. Line them all up next to each other. I'll kind of just pull them between my fingers. You can see that'll take some of the some of the wave out of them, although the wave's not a huge deal, it just makes it a little easier to handle. And I'll cut all three, three ends to the same length. Now I'm going to catch these on the near side of the hook and draw them down to length. And I'm going to wrap back over them, all the way back to just short of the tail. I don't want to disrupt the tail. And then I'll come forward again. Now on an 18 you can build a bit of a taper. So um, I can work this thread back and forth here on the front half of this abdomen just a bit. And again, this is 16 out thread, so it doesn't take much, but just a slight thin taper to that body. And I'm going to pull my super hair up, and you can see my super hair is lined up where it's olive olive brown. Um, how it lines up doesn't make a huge difference. It's just interesting to know. Um, that way you can keep it that way during the rest of the fly. So I'm going to bring this down and around, come around my hook point. And I'm going to tuck this next strap in front. Now very commonly on that first turn those will start to spread out if you take your fingernail and push them back together. As you wrap you can butt those together. And I'm just going to continue to wrap forward. One turn right in front of the other. Right up to the end of the abdomen. And I'll tie that off with a couple of turns. Actually several turns. Super hair is um, not a good material to break your thread when you tie off. It just wants to explode, so um, I'm always a little extra cautious there. Then I can cut that super hair off there. So we've got that nicely segmented 
body, just what we're what we're hoping for there. All right, now I'm going to begin with the thorax. So I'm going to take some olive brown super fine dubbing and just a tiny little pinch of this. It's not going to take much here. I'm going to dub this down on the thread very tightly, up fairly close to the hook. And I'm going to dub this. Now this dubbing for the start of the thorax isn't going to come off the the abdomen. It's going to all be on the front edge here. So I'm just going to build a ball here. About like so. And as I run out, I'll run the thread right up to the hook eye and back to the front edge of that ball. So we just built that little ball. Now I'm going to come in and put the legs in. And the legs are just India hen back or Cock de Leon hen. Um, I've got a pretty nice little hen back right here. So I'm going to use this. take my hen feather here and I'm going to divide or pull out a clump, a fairly good sized clump of fibers and square their tips like so. I'll peel those off the feather. And then I'll come in and I'm just going to use my scissor tips to divide that clump in half. You can kind of see what I've done there. I'll do it where I can see it. There we go. Like so. So they're just split in my fingers into two separate bunches. I'm going to place these on either side. And these are my threads hanging just in front of that ball of, of dubbing. I'm going to measure these legs back just about to the point of the hook. And then I'll pinch them in place there. And I'll come around with a loose turn and tighten it down. And wrap right back up against the front edge of that nub. And that'll spread those legs out to either side. Um, now I don't really want them kind of coming down around the bottom of the fly. I want them out on the side so you can sort of manipulate them at this point. You can't call that manual distribution. That's exactly what we want there. There's nice widespread legs. Now I'm going to pull all these butt ends up and again with my fine tip scissors come in and cut those out. I don't want those stubs to stick any further than the, than the hook eye. And I can wrap over those butt ends. Now I'm going to come in with a pair of CDC feathers. And what I'll do here is I'm going to stack them one on top of the other. I'm just like you, really just like you would hackle feathers. There's two feathers there. And I'll sort of separate the tip into a neat little bundle like so. I'm going to take and lay this in on top. Now you can do a couple different things here. Since I've got the whole feather, um, I, actually I'll show you both ways. Um, since I've got the whole feather here, I can kind of leave this long and pinch this down and tie it down and then draw that down to length into a short little stub like so. Um, or an alternative method is once you've tied that first fly, um, you know, you've cut that off and you've, you're left with what equates to that. Um, at that point, I can take and just cut those center stems out. And then I'll take the remaining fibers and pull them up into a little tuft. And I can cut that to length. Um, so what I'll do, and I'll just go ahead and continue on from here, but I'm going to cut that off fairly square, as square as I can manage, like so. So I've just got a little tuft of those fibers. And I'm going to lay that in on top, pinch it in place, and catch it with a couple of turns. And I'm fairly happy with the length right there. If I, if I wanted it a little shorter, I could just pull on the butt ends to, to shorten it down. I'm going to lift those up and trim those butts out. Just a couple turns to anchor those butt ends down. Now I'm going to take three strands of white floral fiber. Four there, yep. And with these three strands, I'm going to take, and my thread is hanging up here behind the hook eye. Um, if I take these three strands in behind the thread and grab the front end, I can lift them up under the thread. That's an easy way to catch them. So I'm going to catch them there, and then I'm going to wrap back up to the base of the wing over one half along the far side. 
And then I'll pull the, pull the near side back and catch it in place with a couple of turns so that those are on either side of the wing there. Now I'll come in with just another little touch of this olive brown superfine dubbing. It's not going to take much. You can see the, the bulk that we need there is already built. We're just sort of coloring this in. So I'm going to start this dubbing behind the eye and work up that slope right up to the base of the wing. Finish off that thorax and I can come forward and finish just behind the hook eye with bare thread. I'll finish my thread there. Trim it out. And then these fluorofiber strands I'm going to trim just a little proud of the wing so they're a little extra long. There's some foreign object in my dubbing there. I'm going to get rid of him. I don't know what that is. And there is our Juju Emerger. Um, cool little, uh, think of it as an RS2 alternative um, that's a little more versatile. I can fish this fly as a nymph with the indicator split shot, etc., along with something else. Um, or I can fish it as a dry up on the surface, and that little bit of fluorofiber on top, you can see how shiny that stuff is, um, really makes that fly show up on the surface um, a lot better than just that short little CDC wing would. Um, and again, that's a, the same reason for those split tails as, as a, the dry fly use to support the bend of the hook. Um, really versatile little fly. Fish it dry, fish it wet, um, anywhere in between in the water column. I tie it in black, I tie it in brown, olive, uh, what else, black, brown, olive gray, like an RS2. Uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, just a sort of uh, uh, something to have. Uh, variation on the theme that you're not throwing the same thing as everybody else which has always been one of my big things is the last thing I want to do is be throwing the same fly as everybody else and this juju is certainly a different uh, different take on the matter so uh, twist a few of those up see what you think I hope you enjoy it thanks for watching uh, come back soon there'll be some more before too long take care All right, I think we're back, and uh, I, I think my bit rate maybe has gone up a little bit. We'll see uh, how this holds up, but uh, I'm trying to keep up with your, your questions on Instagram as we go, uh, so just keep feeding them in through there. Um, if you have, uh, 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 if you're watching from uh, YouTube or uh, uh, I don't even know where else we've got this going, I think Facebook Live as well, um, but you can feed questions into that feed and, and my, uh, my guys here at Uncle will, will feed those questions to me as well. Um, one of those, uh, yeah, YouTube has got the full fly. So I know that the, uh, the Instagram format doesn't let, let you see the entire fly. So, um, you know, on some of this bigger stuff, it might be a little bit easier to watch on, on YouTube. Um, somebody asked CDC foam versus emergers. Um, maybe CDC versus foam on emergers. Um, CDC floats better, you know, a little tiny bit of foam doesn't actually do you much good. It traps a little bit of air, but um, I, I find CDC is a better floating material and uh, probably more natural looking in the surface. So um, I usually use use CDC. Um, you know, there's, there's a, an old parachute emerger pattern, parachute bar emerger that I fish that has got a little parachute hackle wrapped around a foam post, but um, the foam isn't adding the, uh, adding any flotation to the, to the pattern there. So, um, what rig do I fish that emerger in? Um, uh, pr most often just a standard nymph rig. You know, I fish it, uh, um, you know, during betas, betas hatches. Um, just a, So just a standard nymph rig. Um, you know, typically I like to sight fish. I fish kind of what's, what I call a short leash, which is two stick on indicators about three or four feet up. A um, bit of split shot above my tippet knot, about 12 inches to my first fly, about 12 inches to my second fly. Uh, do you use head cement or glue when tying off? On little stuff, I very rarely do. Um, I use it more as a cosmetic finish than I do as a, uh, uh, you know, something to toughen up the fly, particularly on little stuff. Um, you know, a well-tied whip finish is plenty, as in my experience. 
um, big stuff I do it just to kind of clean the heads up. Um, and I do add it sometimes on little flies just because I take a lot of pictures and it makes the head shiny. Um, but that's purely cosmetic. Uh, so I don't really worry about it on small flies. Um, I'm going to try to open my Instagram here and hopefully this doesn't screw up our, our bit right here. If it does, I'll shut it back down. But I'll see if there's any questions on there that I'm missing before we go on to our next bug, um, which is one of my favorites. Um, it's going to be the mole fly. Um, and... Uh, I guess I got to get this thing feeding in, but it's killing you guys. So off we go. <laughs> All right, failed experiment. Uh, with that, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go on to the mole fly. Mole fly is one of my very favorite flies. If I had, you know, people ask, you know, if you had one fly to fish, which fly would it be? And I hate that question because I like flies so much. Uh, but honestly, if there were, if it was a, a dry fly to rising fish uh, of any sort to any bug, I'd pick a mole fly. Uh, super simple little bug. Um, anybody can tie it and and just plainly put the most effective dry fly I've ever used. So um, let's cook that up and uh, see if uh, we can't get that one pulled up and tie that one up and then we'll come back and, and take some questions and I'll, uh, I'll open my Instagram back up and answer them on there. So with that, let's uh, let's show the mole fly. Here we go. Hey, I'm Charlie Craven. We're back. We're going to tie a few more flies today. Today is... Uh, going to be the mole fly. This is a fly that is uh, sort of undersung and uh, although these days it's sort of getting a little more popular. Um, people ask me all the time if I had one fly to fish which would it be and I hate that question in general but if I had one fly to fish for rising fish that uh, were eating betas or midges the mole fly gets the nod every time for sure no doubt about it. Um, really a very simple fly really cheap to tie quick and easy too so even if you're not much of a tire you can tie this fly in uh, I guarantee it works. Um, so this is a, a, uh, a Betis sort of a merger cripple pattern and it's tied on a Tiemco 2487 so that's a down eye light wire uh, curve shank hook. Um, down eye specifically, don't substitute a 2488 or an up eye hook um, you want something with a down eye. And I'll explain why when I get done with the fly. So I'm going to tie this with uh, 8 dot gray unit thread and I'm going to start this thread just up here behind the eye. Get rid of my tag end. And I'm going to take three strands of white fluoro fiber. So what I usually do with these is I'll leave my thread hanging up here toward the hook eye. And I'm going to take the fluoro fiber behind the thread from the far side of the hook and loop it around the thread and bring it up underneath that turner thread. That's the easiest way to capture it. Got a little curl in that piece, so I'm going to pull that forward a bit. Tighten that turn up, get another turn on there, then I'll sweep all of those forward, like so. So those are all sticking out over the hook eye. I'm going to reposition that hook just a bit. So now I'm going to select a uh, couple of nice CDC feathers. And I usually do tie my molds with with two feathers. So what I'm looking for is something like so. This is just natural mallard CDC. Um, if you know somebody that hunts ducks, you'll get a billion pounds of it from them. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take and sort of even the two tips of those two feathers up and sort of preen the stuff on the bottom down and just bundle that those tips into a little bunch like so. So I'm going to take that that bunch of tips and measure it so it's about a about a shank length long. Um, and I'm going to tie this in up here just behind the hook eye. Get that propped in my fingers a little better. Get a couple turns on it and kind of draw it down the length so it's just about a shank shank length long. And then I'll wrap back over it. I'll lift these buttons up, and when I trim this out, what I want to do, I know my hand will be in the way a bit, but I want to kind of come in at an angle here so that those buttons are tapered. Now, don't throw away what was left of those two feathers. Um, so here's what I've got, got left. If I come in with these remaining two feathers and trim this center stem out, I can now bundle all these loose fibers back up again, 
trim them square on the end, and I've got another bundle ready for the next fly. So I could do that two or three times on the on the same set of feathers. So from this point, I'm just going to start to wrap down over those butts. And when I get to the end of those butts, I'm going to stop. Um, you could also, at this point, trim these fluorofiber fibers out. And I'm not going to trim them to the same length as the wing. I'm going to trim them just a little proud, you know, maybe a quarter quarter their length longer. You can see how they'll stick out just so they're exposed. That fluorofiber was an add-on to the original pattern um, just to make the fly a little easier to see. Um, this fly is pretty flat colored. Um, it's not the easiest fly to see. That's what, I guess it's one liability, but adding a few strands of fluorofiber gives you a little bit of shine and sparkle to look for. Now I'm going to take some brown beaver dubbing, and I've got just a, a little touch of it here, and it's not going to take very much. And beaver dubbing spe specifically, don't use uh, super fine dubbing or synthetic buoyant dubbing. You want beaver dubbing um, here because it will get wetted, and ultimately we want the body of this fly uh, to hang down under the water. So uh, we want a, a dubbing that we can saturate easily, and beaver dubbing works nicely for that. So I'm going to dub that on fairly thin, and you can see I have not dubbed or haven't wrapped the thread all the way down around the hook bend yet. Um, I've got some bare thread between the dubbing and the hook. So I'm going to use that bare thread to travel back. So I've just got that single layer there, back about halfway down the bend, and then I'll start to dub forward. And you don't really have to build much taper here because the tapering of the butts will sort of build it for you. And I want to end right behind the, the wing with the dub thread there. And then I'm going to grab the wing and the fluorofiber and bring my thread in front, just behind the hook eye. So just tuck a wrap in there. I'm not really tying anything off, I'm just moving the thread. I'll set my whip finisher up and I'll sweep my wing back and sneak my whip finish in between the hook eye and the wing. Tighten that down, trim that thread out, and then I like to use a little wire dubbing brush to sort of pick this dubbing out on the body, um, just because so it'll be a, a little bit more uh, easily wetted, so it'll hang down in the surface film. Um, now the idea of this fly, I'll sort of position him here, bring him down just a notch. The idea of this fly is that the water line sits about like so, about parallel with the with the hook eye. Uh, so the wing is on top of the water, but that body is hanging underneath. And um, man, that's really a key for fish. If they, uh, I've had fish that aren't even rising. If you can see a fish kind of just hanging out in shallow water, um, if you throw this over him enough and get a good drift, he'll swim right over and eat it, right up and eat it off the surface. So you can kind of uh, force them to eat the dry with this fly. Um, and man, if they're eating dries on their own, they're suckers for it. Um, you know, this fly should have call, been called the answer. It could have been called love because it's really all you need. Um, this fly could have been called a lot of things, but um, it's not a fly that I ever leave at home if I uh, am going somewhere to fish dries. Um, if there's hatches, betas hatches, you know, small sizes for midges, really any sort of mayfly. You can vary the colors of the body. Um, you can mix mix up the, the general profile uh, or silhouette, uh, but the... Uh, the gist of it remains the same the way it sets in the water. Uh, very simple little fly, don't overcomplicate it, don't add too much to it. Um, right here just like this works wonderfully and you know right now I, I guarantee you I have a hundred of these in my betas box right now um, and honestly I could have just that that compartment out of that box. I just really just need this fly. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Tie some up of your own, take them out and fish them, see what you think. Let me know. Thank me later. See ya. All right, let's tie a Charlie Boy Hopper. Um, obviously, this is one of my favorite flies. I named this after my oldest son, Charlie, and uh, it's a uh, pretty quick, quick little hopper pattern to tie. I came up with, uh, man, 20 years ago or so. I guess I can say that now. And this one's going to be tied on a Tiemco 100 SP BL size 8 is what this is. Now you can't get this hook anymore because I have that wonderful gift of finding things that I really like that they stop making right away. Um, but you could use a regular 100, uh, TMCO 100, in, in its place. Um, and what I've got here is a strip of thin fly foam that is cut to about the 
width of the inside of the hook gap. You can see when I set that in about how wide that is. And before I start the thread or anything, I'm going to take this piece of foam and I'll poke the hook through it right through the center about an inch from the end of the foam strip. And I'll thread that up around the bend and then I can chuck the hook in the vise. And I leave the long end sort of facing away from me for the moment. Now I'm going to take my thread here and this is Danville 3 op monocord in tan. Obviously you can tie this in whatever color you like. You just change your foam color and change your thread color, change your rubber legs color. Um, it's easy enough to make those adjustments. I'm going to start this thread up here just behind the hook eye. And I'm going to dress the hook shank with a nice clean smooth layer of thread all the way back to the bend of the hook. So once I get all the way back here, I'll come forward again. And you can see how I sort of cross hatch that. You can see that's got some texture to it. So now I've got a scrap of foam that is about 2 by 2 millimeters. Um, about. It doesn't have to be exact. And this is going to be our binder strip. So I'm going to take this and set it in behind the hook eye here. Catch it with a couple turns. And then just spiral wrap back over it. All the way to the bend. Kind of make a little band back there. And then I can cut that off. And I'll cross hatch that piece of foam. That binder strip is to give us a, uh, a little surface area back there or uh, down here on the hook shank. So we've got something to glue to here when we get to it. Now I'm going to take my piece of foam. My thread's hanging at the bend. I'm going to take my piece of foam and just pull it forward and that'll push the thread to my near side. And I'm going to slide this piece of foam up around the bend of the hook right up against the binder strip. And you can see when I do that this back end of this foam is elevated. And that's going to be important. We're going to want to make sure that that, that stays elevated uh, the whole time. You can also see that opens up the hook gap considerably here underneath the fly. So as I pull this piece of foam underneath the hook, I'm going to measure where the hook eye lines up. And again, poke a hole right through the center using the tips of my scissors. I go from both sides so it doesn't tear. And then I'll push the hook eye through that hole. Like so. So I've got the foam threaded onto the hook at the bend and at the eye. Like so. Now I'm going to come in with a little bit of Zappa Gap. And I like the Zappa Gap with the brush. That makes a big difference as far as getting it applied smoothly and, and lightly. And I'm going to go and cover the entire upper surface of this foam. Binder strip everything up off the extended section. I want to cover all that. Um, if you're going to air, air on the thin side. Less is, less is better than more. Um, and I may have a bit more than I need. You can always use a scrap of foam to sort of wipe off the excess. So now I'm going to take and I'm going to fold this piece of foam from the front to the back. And you can see I kind of push it down onto the top of the, of the bottom layer. And then when I get to the bend here, I'm actually going to lift that elevated piece up so that I maintain that curvature, like so. Um, that's stuck together very nicely. It doesn't always. I'm not really too concerned with it sticking together up here on the hook shank but I am concerned with it staying stuck together back here as it extends off the bend of the hook. So um, if you've got a few gaps here along the shank, it's not a big deal. We'll have a chance to fix that. So now again, my thread is hanging back here at the bend. It's coming out the near side of the fly, right at the bend of the hook. I'm going to create my first segment here. So I'm going to come about halfway around and tighten. Put two or three turns on there just to create that first segment right there at the bend of the hook. And I do like to, before that glue gets too dry, I want to make sure everything's squared up on the hook shank. Now as I start to segment the body, I'm going to make three segments, but I need to think in fourths. So I want to move the thread forward about one-fourth of the shank length there, across the top, and make the first segment. And I'll turn this so you can see what I just did there. You can see that that kind of comes across the top. So I'm going to move about a fourth of the way again. Create the second segment. And you can see I'm not making eight or ten turns to make each of those segments. I'm just making a turn or two. I'm trying to keep the bulk down. And then this last segment I'll just divide in half. So you can see how I made three segments there, but ended up with four. The fourth one is just left over. So now I'm going to come in with a double-edged razor blade. And this one's just been broken in half. 
And you can see how the back end of this fly extends up. What I'm going to do with this razor blade is I'm going to lay it flat along the top of the body and I'm just going to start to push it into that foam. So you can see the angle that that sets at. It's, you're looking right on the edge there. So that cut is going to come straight through the end of that foam. When it's all said and done, that, that cut looks like it's at an angle, but it is a straight flat cut. So to continue with that, I'm just going to push this sharp, sharp blade straight back through to cut that off and end up with that angled looking cut, although it's a flat cut and it's angled foam. You can see how the foam would fit back together. Um, this piece of foam is handy, that you've got left over here is handy. On the next one, if you've got too much super glue, that's pretty nice to butter that off with. Now one of the things that uh, when I first started coming up with this fly that I noticed with the real hopper is the back end of the body is fairly narrow. So I'm not going to cut this to a point, but I am going to cut it to a taper. So I'm just going to knock the edges off, like so. And then I'm going to take my double-edged blade and I'm going to do the same things to the side of the head. Um, the head is a little bit wider here on this foam from where it's folded, so I'm just going to square that up as well. So I'm just going to cut a little sliver off of each side. Like so. So that head is now square and the same width as the rest of the body. Now for the legs, I'm going to take two strands of medium brown round rubber legs. I'm going to take one on each side, so I've just separated those two strands. And I'm going to start on my near side, and I'm going to catch this first leg in that first segment. And I try to keep that leg lined up with the seam in the foam. I'm just going to catch it with a single turn there on my near side. Then I'm going to cross my thread back over the top. I'm going to cross my thread back into that second segment and catch the leg again along the near side, just with the turn. And then again, I can sort of wiggle and position that as need be. And then to do the far side leg, I'm going to do the same steps in the opposite order. So I'm going to catch it at the back, cross my thread forward, and catch it again. And now I can trim these back legs. These back legs are going to be just a hair longer than the body. And the front legs are about two-thirds of that length, so they're a little shorter. And that right there was the original version of the Charlie Boy Hopper, just like that. And it actually catches fish just fine. It's super simple. Problem is, is it's very hard to see. You know, as you look at it here on the screen, it's a fly that's an inch long and a relatively light tan color. You wouldn't think it would be that hard to see. And if you're fishing from a boat where you're looking down on top of it, that's the view that you get. Um, the problem is, is when you're wade fishing, the view that you get is this little narrow profile that we've got from the front. So not much profile. So I came home and tried to add something to the top of it and what I eventually settled on was deer hair which worked wonderfully for it because it adds some uh, surface area to the fly, makes the fly a lot more buoyant and uh, gives you a little bit more uh, silhouette on top so that you got something that you can actually hunt for on the water. So the wing on this is going to be made out of white-tailed deer hair um, and this is typically sold by Nature Spirit. It's called Humpy Deer. Um, I don't use spinning deer. The tips aren't very good. Humpy Deer has t tends to have very nice tips. And I'm going to take a pretty good sized bunch. Very often I'm using this fly as a dry dropper fly. Um, so I want it to be extra buoyant. So I cut a pretty good sized bunch of hair off, off of the skin here. Give you an idea of what I just cut out of there. And I'm going to hold it as close to the tips as I can and clean all this under fur out. And I'd love to show this to you, but um, all that under fur ends up all over me and all over everything else on top of the desk and the camera and it drives me nuts so you'll have to just trust me that all I did was that and that to pull all that junk out of the bottom. So now I'm going to take this clump of hair and I'm going to put it in my medium sized stacker and the right amount of hair just about fills up the inside of a medium stacker if I kind of get that in there where you can see it. You can see that just about fills that that hole. And I'm going to stack it up so it's nice and square and even on the ends. I'm going to pull that hair out of the stacker. Oops. 
lost a few of them there. I'm going to measure this clump against the hook, and I want it to be about a hook length long, so from the hook eye to the bend. And what I'm using to measure is my thumbnail here on this back side. So once I've got that measurement, I'm going to change hands. And I'm going to go ahead and do this up here where you can see it. I can't get too close here, but I'm going to come up with my scissors, a good sharp pair of scissors. I'm going to make one clean cut just past the ends of my fingers here. Like so. And you see what kind of mess that made, but that gave you the idea. What I want is a clean square edge on this clump of hair. I'm going to clean that up just a bit. So I'm going to take this clump of hair, I'm going to set these butt ends about halfway up the head of the fly. So the butt ends line up with about halfway up the head of the fly. I'm going to bring my thread up and over. I'm just going to start to crease the hair. So just a little tug on the thread um, to crease the hair right there. I'm going to put my index finger against the far side of the hook. and I'm going to pull straight down on the thread. And that's going to flare that hair up into a nice, neat little round spun ball. The reason this comes out so nice and round right here is because I cut it square on the ends. Had I had a ragged cut there, if I went in after the fact and tried to clean it up, it wouldn't come out nearly as round. You can see how that starts to kind of finish out the head shape of the fly. Now for the whip finish, I'm just going to come in and I'm going to go right through those butt ends. About three turns. I don't have to put a lot of tension on it because I'll tighten it down here and you can see how that hair will sort of flare up a bit. One short one in there. You can see how much surface area we've got. We've got a big widespread wing. And then one last little thing that I do to every one of these that I tie, and that really is the truth, is I'm going to use a Sharpie marker and put a couple of eyeballs on him. Because flies with eyes cast more accurately than flies that don't have eyes because they can see where they're going. So it's not a dot, it's kind of a long oval, like a real hopper's eye. One on each side, super easy. You can come in and put a little shot of head cement along those thread wraps. Although, honestly, this fly uh, sure takes a beating. I've never had this fly come apart. The deer hair will get chewed off if you catch a pile of fish on it. But the foam body, um, I have one sitting on the visor in my truck right now that's got teeth marks in it that um, I could still go out and catch fish on it tomorrow. It's still in perfectly fine shape, but it's, it's chewed all to hell. Um, really a pretty quick quick to tie fly. You know, I sit and talk about it and, and it takes 10 minutes to tie or 15 minutes to tie. Um, in the case of a uh, real life scenario, this is about a two or three minute fly. If you've got your foam cut and your legs cut, everything goes together pretty quickly. Um, a great dry dropper fly. This is my, my main uh, dry fly in my hopper copper dropper rigs. Uh, very quick and easy to tie. Um, great profile. Um, took way longer to develop than it does to tie. But that is the finished Charlie Boy Hopper. Tie some of these up, take them out, hang a, a two bit hooker or a Copper John or um, you know, a CDC Golden Stone, hang something like that underneath them and see what doesn't come and find them. Um, really a fun, fun fly to fish, fun, fun fly to tie. Fills the box up quick, looks good, everybody likes it. Hope you do too. All right, I think we got through it. Um, that one was a little rough. I think my feed got a little bit better. I think we discovered that my wife was watching television in the other room and, and she shut it off, which I appreciate. So um, that was all for you. So she's mad. It's it's all on you, uh, not on me. Uh, at any rate, that was the Charlie Boy Hopper. That's, uh, that's a fly that I fish uh, almost every day during the summer. I use that as my dry and my dry dropper rig. Um, I've got a couple new variations of, uh, of uh, dry flies for my dry dropper rigs that are uh, coming out for next year, but uh, uh, that's been the one I've used for the last 20 years or so, and uh, it works wonderfully as a just a plain old hopper as well. Um, you know, typically I'll, I'll uh, uh, tie that in a size 8. That's really about the only size I fish anymore is just a straight up size 8. Um, it seems to be just, uh, you know, not too big, but big enough to float everything that I need it to float, and it holds everything up and, and uh, still gets eaten. So, uh, that's why I go with that one. Uh, one of the questions that came in in the meantime 
was why do I use TMCO hooks and uh, how do I pick uh, the hooks for each pattern? Um, TMCO hooks I've used since long before I was ever a, an Umpqua tire, um, you know, back when I was a commercial tire. And now Maybe I want to go for my customer. Maybe we're back. <laughs> yeah, I think we're back. Okay. <laughs> At any rate, I, I used it because I wanted good quality hooks for my customers. Um, and, and, you know, it's uh, based on reputation. As a commercial tire, if you tie uh, really good flies on really cheap hooks, nobody's happy. doesn't matter how good the fly is if the hook straightens out every time. Um, and I've learned the hard way over the years, you know, a cheap hook is not not worth what you pay for it. Uh, it's not worth it no matter how little you pay for it. It's, honestly, it's not worth it if they give them to you. So um, I use I use uh, uh, good quality hooks on on everything that I tie, and TMCO has always been my first choice. Uh, I'm not saying that because I'm an Umqua guy. That uh, that predates my Umqua guy days. So um, TMCO, I think, makes the best hooks. There's some other good hooks out there. There's a lot of junky hooks these days. Um, you know, the easiest way to tell the difference is if they're cheap, they're pretty junky. Um, and that's, you know, I, I sell a lot of hooks. I see a lot of hooks. Um, I know all about hooks. So, uh, that's, that's my advice I can give you on that. Um, so we're going to, uh, we're going to go on to the dirty, the dirty hippie, uh, which is a fly named after my wife who's sitting in the other room, not watching TV, probably reading a book and probably just thinking about how much she loves me. Um, I, I'm sure that's what it is. But when we come back from this, um, the uh, oh and I yeah I'm supposed to tell you guys that this uh, this dirty hippie is huge so Instagram might might not be the best venue to watch this um, it's on Facebook and YouTube as well live as we go here um, so you might want to watch it there because the fly's big and it's not going to fit on the screen very well um, so you might want to transfer over and, and watch it from there um, but when we come back from this I think we're going to talk a little bit about commercial tying I think we've got some some questions there um, but with that we're going to tie the dirty hippie this is a uh, uh, a streamer that I that I came up with uh, trying to get a, a large profile fly that wasn't uh, big and bulky, which is sort of my my uh, uh, my plan on all my streamers these days. You know, this was this was one of the first ideas that I had to use a spreader, um, and this sh this shows how to do that and how to make a, a fly that's got a big outside profile, um, but still casts and swims and sinks the way it's supposed to. So, uh, with that, let's uh, let's get cooking on a dirty hippie, and uh, we'll come back for some questions afterwards and. We'll finish up for the night. Stay tuned. All right, we're going to tie a dirty hippie. This is the original version, uh, sort of the OG dirty hippie. And, uh, you know, this is in the baby brown shop configuration. Um, so that, there's a look at the uh, finished product, and you'll kind of see where we're getting to. Um, what you want to sort of pay attention to is how wide this fly is. Um, we built a big wide fly that's got a large outside profile, but without a ton of material to make it heavy to cast or to slow its sink rate down. So I'm going to show you how we do that. So pull that guy out. And we're going to start with a uh, TMCO 5263 is what hook I've got here. And I've got a large size copper cone that I've slid onto the hook. Um, now this is not a cone head fly, but we're going to use that cone to help spread some of the materials to give it a little bit wider profile. So I'm going to start with some Danville 3 out monocord. And about a third of the way back from the hook eye, a third of a shank length back from the hook eye, I'm going to start that thread and I'm going to wrap a thread base um, back to just short of the The hook point there and I just want to dress the shank here and what I'm doing is creating a base to put the lead on um, originally on this fly I just wrapped the lead on the hook and the problem with that is the lead as you fish um, if it's not tied down will slide back so uh, I'm now going to take some 35 thousandths lead wire and I'm going to grab the short end and right over that thread base begin to wrap and I'm going to make about a dozen turns. No, 
maybe 13. And I'll break that end off and break that back end off. So we've got a nice heavy lead base and you can see when I slide that cone back up against the front of the lead, um, I've still got about a fourth anyway of the hook shank left in front and that's sort of what we want. You know, on this fly we're going to actually crowd the hook eye on purpose. Um, that's going to be part of what helps to build the fly. So now I'm going to take the thread and I'm not really trying to cover this lead, but what I'm trying to do is anchor it all down. So we're going to continue covering this lead uh, just with the crosshatch layer of thread just to anchor it down in place so that it doesn't move later. About like so. So now I'm going to take my thread just up off the end of the lead. So I'm just hanging on bare, bare shank at the front of the lead. I'm going to push that cone back. I'm going to pick the thread up. I'll try to do this on your side. I'm going to cross the thread to the front of the cone. I'm going to do it on my side, I guess. You get a couple turns around the hook shank, and that'll hold that cone in place. You can see the cross of the thread there across the top. And what I usually do is I'll cross back and forth a couple of times. Now, when I come back here, see how I'll come at a long angle and come around the hook. So we've got this span of thread right here. Once I've got that, I'll wrap up over it, and you can see that as I tighten that, that squares that cone up on the hook so everything's nice and straight. Then I'll jump forward over the cone again and just let my thread hang there for the moment. Um, not a bad idea to put some head cement on it at this point. I use this Solarize Ultra Thin and a pretty good coat on there uh, just to lock everything down in place. I want to get all the way around. I usually do cover those crossing thread wraps. Kind of push it up inside the cone as well. Just get everything saturated there. Pick up any extra off the off the bottom. And I'll come in with my UV light. And cook that up a bit. So that's now all locked down in place. We've got a nice little thin coat over the top of it, not adding a lot of bulk, just kind of smoothing things off. All right, now I'm going to take the thread and wrap all the way up to the hook eye, and then back again to the front edge of the cone. And as I said, this cone is going to act as a spreader. This is going to help to spread our material out and give us a wide profile to the fly. So I'm going to start with three or four strands each of, I've got gold, pearl, and copper flashaboo. And I've cut them their whole length here. And I'm going to tie these in at the center of their length, just a turn or two in front of the cone. And I'm going to pull half back onto the far side of the hook and wrap over it right up to the cone. And I'll pull the other half back and catch it. And then snug those wraps right up to the cone. And you, see, you can see how that kind of spreads those out a bit. So that we've got some some width, some height to the fly. Um, and I usually leave that the whole length of the uh, of the hank of flashaboo. It just makes the material easier to handle. So now I'll take these back and clip them back in my material spring so they're back out of the way for the moment. Alright, now I've got a tan marabou feather and I want a big one. I want something with real long flues like this. And you can see this one through the center here sort of matted down and that's because um, the companies that sell marabou these days just let it air dry. You kind of squeeze it out and let it air dry. And you can see that along the stem there it's sort of matted down. Um, if you take your dubbing brush so if you take your dubbing brush and run it up the feather like so, you can see that pulls out some of that matting, sort of cleans it up. I usually do this on my pant leg. I'll do it up here where you can see it, and you can see how that's unmatted those fibers and kind of fluff those up a bit. 
So now what I want to do is this big thick stem down here at the bottom. I want to get rid of most of that. So I'm going to come up on the feather and start to peel the fibers off. So that I've got gotten up to the thinner part of the stem. You can see the, the stem from there up is relatively thin. I'm actually going to go a bit further. Like so. And then I'll turn the feather over. And these feathers, you know, just like all feathers, have an inside and an outside. And the side you're looking at is the inside there. I'm going to hold the feather by the tip and create a separation point where I'm down into these longer flues. Once I've got that separation point, you can wet that tip down just a bit to make it a little easier to manage. And I'm going to tie it in just in front of this cone. Now as I do this, I'm not going to tie in right at that separation point. I'm going to overlap a bit up onto these fibers. This is going to make a more secure tie down and keep that feather from breaking so easily. So I'll tie that down and that was again with the inside of the feather toward the hook just like a regular soft tackle fly. And one little tip I can give you here is this long stem. Cut it down fairly short at that point. I'll come in and grab that tip with my hackle pliers. I'm going to stand the feather up and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to fold this just like a, a wet fly collar. So it's a marabou feather. I'm just going to treat it like a soft tackle. And what I'll do here is I'm going to sweep these fibers back. I've wet my fingers a bit. I'm going to sweep them all back to the back side of the stem. Like so. Now I'm going to begin to wrap and as I wrap I'm just putting the stem one turn in front of the other there at the front of the hook. You can see I can kind of stroke those fibers back as I go. Right up to the bare stem. And then I'll tie it off with a couple of turns there. And pull those half pliers out. All right, once that's tied off, I'll use my dubbing brush again to sort of sweep and untangle any fibers that got wound down in there. You can see how that cone is helping to spread those marabou fibers. I'll come in and trim that stem out. Now I'm going to, again, just wet my first two fingers and my thumb. And I'm going to sweep this back 360 around the hook, and I'll just take just a few turns back up against the front edge of the cone. No, I won't. Cut. Now I'm going to wet my fingers. I'm going to lift this marabou up. And hold it just above the hook. You can see how it's enveloping the top half of the cone. And then I'll start to wrap back over it right up to the front edge of the cone. So I've just swept all that marabou up to the top side of the cone. All right, so once we've got all that marabou up on top of the hook, I'm going to brush that back. And I use that brush more than my fingers because there's a hook point down in there just waiting to get me. You can do it however you like. And now the belly. Uh, so this is what's called temple fox. And you can you know, certainly use um, arctic fox. Um, temple fox is just a bit longer. It's a little nice soft fur like like Arctic Fox, but a little longer. And for the belly on this fly, on a big size two like this, um, that extra length helps. So I'm going to draw out a clump and cut it off down close to the hide. And I'll now take this, and I want to pull most of this underfur out of the bottom. You can see that big chunk of underfur. I'm going to get rid of that. So it just got these nice long tips. And I sort of finger stack this, you know, if you get anything extra long you can kind of pull it out, but I don't want it perfectly square, and I don't want it all the same exact length. So 
but I'm going to clump about like so. Um, you can see as I measure that, and it's kind of spread out into a sheet there, as I measure that, I'm going to measure that back to the ends of the marabou here. And so I'm going to, my thread's hanging right at the front edge of the marabou. I'm going to take this and, if anything, I'll be just a little short of the end of the marabou, and kind of pinch this in place against the far side of the hook. Now I'm going to come around with a very loose turn of thread. You can see that's damn near slack. And then I'll pull up on the thread, and that will allow that to roll to the bottom. And I'll get a couple turns on there. You can see that fox is now across the bottom of the fly cover in the bottom half of the cone. Again, I'll wet my fingers a bit. I'll sweep this up on either side of the hook point. And anchor it down with a few more turns. Again, right up against the front edge of the cone. I'll pull these butt ends down. And you want to push your thread out of the way. You can see how I'm doing that there with my middle finger. And trim those, those butts out. And again, you can use the use the brush to sort of part everything back. So we've got that nice two-tone top and bottom color there. All right, now we're going to start to work on the on the head. And what I want to do here is bump my thread forward. We've got a little thread head um, kind of built up. I'll just smooth that off, and then I'm going to bump my thread just in front of it, where I'm back down onto the bare part of the hook shank. Now I'm going to reposition the, the camera here so that you can get a little closer view of the head end of the fly because uh, we're going to extend a little bit off the hook eye here. got that repositioned. I'm just going to kind of sweep everything back again. And this is where we're going to come in to put the collar on. And again, that thread's hanging just in front of that uh, thread head that we sort of built tying the wing in. And I'm going to come in with some tan Arctic Fox fur. And this comes on a, on a zonker strip, basically. You can see a strip of leather there. So it's like a lot like a rabbit strip. But what I want to do is take a nice size clump here and sort of even the tips up so that I've got a nice little bundle and then I'll cut it off the hide. So I've got a nice little little tuft of that Arctic Fox. Now what I'll do with this, again, I don't worry too much about the, the under fur and the butt ends on this because most of that's going to get cut off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sheet, and my thread's hanging there at the front end, and I'm going to fold it around the hook. You can see those tips go about halfway up the wing. I'm going to hold that in place, and again, with that same move, big loose turn, and I'm going to tighten up, tighten by pulling the thread up. And I should be cinching that down, there we go, just in front of that nub from where we tied the wing down. You can see how that'll distribute the hair, get one more turn on there, all the way around the hook. It's always good to take a look all the way around, make sure it did go all the way around. Pretty happy there, that looks pretty good. So now I'm going to cut the butt ends off, and this is usually two cuts to do this, so I'm going to lift the top half and just kind of sneak my scissor tips in there as close as I can and trim that out. pull the bottom half down and again push my thread out of the way the very tips of my scissors here and cut that out at the front you can see I'm jammed right up to the hook eye which is on purpose that's that's the whole idea you can see how the slide is gaining height and, and depth here and I'll sweep this back I'm going to anchor that down good and tight and bring the thread right up to the back edge of the hook eye And now we're going to put the, the face on this. And what this is, is tan UV ice stubbing. So I've got a clump of it here. I'm going to take and sort of align it. You can see I'll just pull it apart and restack it. 
And what I want to do here is, you can see as I pull it apart, let's say that those fibers are, are two inches long or an inch long. Um, you can see when I pull it apart there, I'm going to restack and then I'll pull almost apart. So I've got it overlapping. And the idea there is that I've got the centers of that clump overlapping. And that's what I'm going to tie down so I can get a little extra length out of it. So once I've got that, I'm going to take that sheet and treat it the same way that I did the, the fox fur. I'm going to fold it around the hook. And just behind the eye here, I'm going to come with that loose turn and catch it. You can see how that's kind of coming over the top of the fly. It's a pretty sparse little collar. And it's really just to add some flash. And that's why I use, on all the colors, no matter what color hippie I tie, I, I use this tan, tan UV eye stubbing because of the UV part of it. Um, that's going to be the highlights that I'm going after. So now this front end, I'm going to take my thumb and index finger of my thread hand and just push this back. And you can sort of distribute it a bit so you get a little bit better distribution around the hook. And I'm going to jump the thread to just behind the hook eye. Now, as I do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a thread dam behind the hook eye. I'm not going to wrap back up over this dubbing. I'm just going to build a thread head at its front edge. And I want to pull those wraps down good and tight there. And what that'll do is force all of that back into a nice little top layer. And I'll come in with my whip finisher. Finish off the thread head. And then I'll cut out my thread. So that's the tie-in part. So now I'm going to come back in with that dubbing brush. And I'm going to sweep all of that UVI stubbing back around. You can see it's just adding a bit of highlight. It's not a really thick, heavy, heavy layer. It's just some flash, and you'll see on the finish fly, um, it's really pretty subtle. But you can see how that pretty sparse all the way around. All right. Now we're to the fun part. I'm going to take a uh, Prismacolor marker in sepia, and I'm going to use the white end. And I'm going to start up here at the head. I'm going to kind of pinch the, the body of the fly together. And I'm going to start just behind the hook. I'm going to create bands coming up the top half of that collar over that flash right up to the end of the fur. So I just did that on this near side. Now I'm going to do the far side. And I obviously try to make sure that those lines line up top to bottom. Like so. Now I'll grab all of that marabou and I'll continue barring right up to the ends of the marabou. And the, the marker won't bleed all the way through the marabou, so you've got to go at it from both sides. And you can do a, a few narrow bands or a bunch of narrow bands or a few wide bands, you can sort of control how much of that you put on at a time. But I do want to make sure that I get that all the way across, all the way around that marabou. And you can certainly use barred marabou, um, you know, the, the prepackaged, pre pre barred marabou. Um, the reason I like to do it with the markers, I can kind of control how many bars, what color they are, where they go. Now, one last thing before I put this marker away, so I'm going to sweep the top of the head back, and I'll use the broad part of the tip. I want to color the top of the head all the way down to the thread head. Make a dark surface there, right across the top, like so. And that's really essentially just over the flash. Some of it might work down into that fox, but it's just to darken the top half of the fly. Now I'm going to use a uh, an orange sepia, or I'm sorry, an orange Prismacolor marker, and again with the white end. I'm just going to sort of highlight the bottom edge of the cheeks here. So I'll sweep that back and just brush the marker back over that. I'm really just trying to hit the, the flash as much as I can all the way around the bottom half. Just sort of blush the cheeks here. Just got a bit of a, an orange highlight there.
about like so. Um, and then once that has dried for a few seconds, I'll take my, my brush back through it and that'll separate anything that was matted down and sort of soften those bars that we built in there. You can see how I'm just sort of sweeping everything back and loosening those fibers up. So there's our front silhouette. Alright, now the eyes. Um, the eyes are quarter inch gold holographic dome eyes. The eyes are quarter inch gold holographic dome eyes. And to glue them on, I'm going to use a product called Tear Mender. Um, Tear Mender is a, a latex adhesive, and it is the best stuff I've found for attaching these eyes. So I'm going to take a long bodkin here, and I'm going to dip it in the Tear Mender. And mine's fairly goopy. It's uh, dried out a bit, and I've actually left the lid off of it on purpose so that it will do that. It's pretty goopy. I'm going to turn the fly up. And I kind of feel with my fingers here where the front of the cone is. And I'll put my needle down right at the front edge of that cone and just let that drop sort of bleed in. And I'm going to do that same thing on my near side. And then I'm going to take the lid and put it back on the tear mender. Because if you spill this stuff, it makes a huge mess. All right, so we've got a little gob of glue on both sides, you know, equally placed. I'm going to take one of these dome eyes and press it in here along the near side, like so, right on top of that glue. And then I'll take the other eye and put it here on the far side. And you can see there's some, some glue that's still sticking out. Um, don't sweat that, that actually comes out pretty easily. So now I take my fingers from the front and I can kind of gauge where those eyes are and I can feel that that far eye is just a little further forward than I want it to be. So I'll just slide it back, get those two eyes aligned, and then I sort of pinch the fly together. And again, this is going to help to build some height. So I'm essentially gluing the eyes um, almost to each other across the center of the hook shank, right at the front edge of the cone. Like so. I got a little, little happy with that dab of glue there. And this stuff does dry fairly clear. You can see it actually dry. It's almost dry now. It dries very quickly. I'll pinch that all into place, and I'm not pretty happy there. Kind of sweep everything back again. Now for the flash that's hanging out the tail end, what I do with this is I'll hold the fly hook eye up. And I'm going to come in from the ends, and I want to trim this flash just a, a bit proud of the marabou, uh, but not all to the same length. You can see I'll turn the fly and sort of nip away at it so that they've got kind of ragged ends there. Sweep that fur up and get it put back in the vise for you. a little more centered here. All right, so now you can get a, a better overall view of the, the finished fly with the whole thing on the screen. Sweep everything back. You can see that cone from all dimensions sort of adds body to the fly. Sweep everything back and that belly down along the bottom. You see how that all fits together. And one last little shot of head cement here on the thread head and we're done. Um, this fly is a uh, you know, baby brown trout imitation. It imitates a baby brown. Um, it's one of the most effective color combinations that I've used on any of my streamers, this sort of tan cream color. Put a little solar res on there. Cook them up there on the front end. 
and that's the dirty hippie named after my wonderful wife Lisa. Uh, she is, uh, yep, yeah, she's a dirty hippie, all right. Um, and her license plate on her truck actually says that, so yeah, she knows it's named after her. It's all part of the program. Now there's an articulated version of this also um, that's got a second size two hook um, attached with four glass beads between the two hooks. Um, and that back hook just has the marabou wrapped as I did to begin with on this fly. So um, if you want to tie the articulated version, I, the back hook is just the front quarter or fifth of the hook uh, with the marabou feather wrapped on it and then attached so that adds some length to it. Um, this version here, um, as it sits, is about four inches long or so, three and a half inches long, I guess. Um, you know, nice, easily castable streamer. This fly uh, has a huge outside profile, but not a ton of filling. Um, this is one of those flies you can kind of see there's not a whole lot in the middle. And the whole idea of this fly was to build a fly that had big outside profile without having all the filling in it. And I like to use that uh, uh, you know, filled donut analogy. And that is that you don't have to put all the filling in the donut. The fish doesn't know the donut doesn't have filling in it until he's eaten it. So you don't have to build in the rib cage in every fin. We just really want the outside silhouette, and that's the idea of this fly. Um, with all that marabou and fox on there, it's a really uh, lively, lively pattern, and water swims really nicely. Um, sinks well, casts super easy, casts like a bullet. Everything sort of slims down and kind of get, as I sweep that all back, kind of get what we're shooting for there for outside profile. Pretty bait fishy little pattern. And tied in brown, rainbow. There's a Platte River version. There's an all-black version. Um, you know, if you're going to have a streamer, you should have a black version as well. But um, this is my primary. This is the brown trout, dirty hippie. Hope you enjoyed watching. Tune in. There will always be some more coming. You guys take care. And we are back. Uh, so that concludes the uh, Dirty Hippie. And uh, I, I, uh, if you were watching it here on Instagram, you got a very narrow view of it. I suggest uh, uh, going back over to the Umqua Feather Merchants YouTube channel and checking it out there. The whole fly show is on that screen. Um, Instagram is just sort of constricted. Things are shortened down a little bit. It's not quite so easy to see. Uh, I'm going to uh, open up my Instagram here again and see if I can get... And uh, yeah, each fly is live individually now, too, they're telling me. So um, you can see, you know, just pick the ones that you want to watch. So um, that was my dirty hippie. That uh, a couple of the questions that came in were where I like to fish that fly. Um, I, you know, I typically fish it on the Colorado and the Eagle. You know, any of the bigger rivers in Colorado, the Arkansas, uh, I pounded them up pretty good there. Um, I fished it uh, all over Wyoming, any bigger river, uh, any place you're floating. Um, one of the nice things about that fly is it's a, a, a pretty easy, to, easy fly to cast. Um, so even wade fishing, you don't have to throw the thing a mile, um, but you know, wade fishing, you can, you can really huck it out there. Um, and it swims really nicely. It sinks, sinks and gets down. Um, it's easy to see in the water. Um, it's a fly that I like to fish slowly. All that marabou really breathes nicely, um, kind of moves around in the water, um, you know, a little bit better than, than some of the more streamlined patterns, you know, baby gongo would be a fly. I like to fish fast, uh, dirty hippie would be a fly. I like to fish slow. So, um, you know, as odd as that sounds in big water and high water, I like to fish that dirty hippie. I can kind of throw it up in pockets next to the bank and with a little creative mending, keep that fly in the pocket where I need it to be and, and uh, sort of drive them nuts with it. So that was the, the design idea behind that and, um, you know, where I would pick a dirty hippie over a uh, uh, baby gonga or vice versa. Uh, yeah, sunscreen. I know I actually was outside today taking down my award winning Christmas lights. Uh, yeah, I've got an award because I had the best Christmas lights in the town of Palmer Lake, Colorado this year. Uh, so I was taking down my Christmas lights today and I didn't wear a hat or sunscreen because I didn't think it was going to take that long. Well, let me tell you, it took. It, they're still not all down. Let, let's just say, let's just be honest. They're still not all down. But I did spend the day outside in the sunshine and I had my sunglasses on. So I've got some raccoon eyes and uh, I'm trying to emulate Lance Egan because he's always got raccoon eyes and everyone knows he's the coolest guy around. Uh, so there's that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll wear sunscreen next time. Uh, that's, that's how you get it. That's how they get you. Um, 
Let's see what else here. Uh, it's about time to take those Christmas lights down. Yeah, it is. Uh, I've been busy, man. It's been busy around here. Shop's been busy. Um, what else we got going on? Uh, let's see. Russ had asked me, or Sam had asked me, uh, to talk a little bit about commercial tying. I don't know exactly what they had in mind there, but I'll I'll chat about that a little bit. Um, you know, for a good portion of my life, from when I was about twelve years old till um, you know, realistically till I was in my thirties, I was a commercial tire. Um, so I tied flies for for shops all around Denver and and really the whole Rocky Mountain West. Um, and you know, it it was a great job when I was young. Uh, you know, I was able to tie flies uh, you know fairly quickly and learn while I was young, while I wasn't starving to death, while I was learning to do it. Um, you know, it, it's hard to keep up with and and do you know in that day day and age before the internet anyway. Um, selling flies at wholesale, it's hard. It was hard to make a living from, um, but it gave me a, a huge amount of practice. And you know, that's you know, people ask how you got how I get good at tying flies, um, and really the answer is just like everything else. You know, if you go do it a lot, if you fish a lot, if you play golf a lot, um, if you tie a lot of flies, you'll get better at it. And I just had the opportunity to practice a lot more than the than the average guy did. So, um, you know, that was that was some good times, and and uh, um, you know, I'm really glad I did it. I don't want to do it again. I don't want to sit down and be locked to the vice. I still love tying flies. I tie flies every day. Um, I enjoy it even more now because I'm not in a rush. There's no uh, um, uh, no pressure on me to 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 get this big order done so that I can uh, pay the light bill. But uh, uh, it's still something that I enjoy doing. It's something I still do a lot of. I still tie orders occasionally, and uh, you know, as long as it's something that I don't hate in general, I, I still enjoy that. Um, Let's see what what else we got here. Um, Josh is uh, took my glasses off. Umqua is the best around. That's absolutely true. Um, you know, I uh, I always finish these things up thanking those guys. That uh, um, honestly is one of the best run companies in all of fly fishing, and uh, I deal with all of them. And, uh, I've never failed to be impressed by the team that is at Umqua. And, and again, you know, this is not me harping because I'm an Umqua guy. Uh, I'm an Umqua guy because I can harp. Uh, uh, fantastic group of guys. Every every guy there is is 100% invested, uh, and and they do a wonderful job. I couldn't say enough about them, um, except for Russ. He's got, like, this big, weird, woolly mammoth beard going now. It's, it's creepy. He's a good fisherman now. So uh, he's probably not as good as Lance Egan uh let's uh what else like i don't know that might be all we have for the evening uh best river in colorado for quarter one fishing that's a good question any tailwater i would say um you know the the i'd say the south Platte is probably your best bet although it doesn't need any more people down there on it um uh, you know the uh with COVID, everybody and their brother started fishing this year so water's getting a little crowded um i'd say uh uh, you know, spread out where you can. There's a lot of water down there that's still really good. Everybody's kind of locked into the sections up near Deckers, but there's, uh, you know, all of Cheeseman Canyon that you can walk up into, uh, and there's a lot of water down below Deckers and Trumbull that, that's pretty good. So um, I'd point you out there. Uh, poor Russ. You know, Ru Russ is a really good guy, um, and and not a lot of people know that uh, Russ Miller, uh, his full name is Russell, R-U-S-C-L-E. Uh, which is an unusual spelling, but I think, you know, um, probably is based on his his incredible physique. Um, if you've never met Russ, you're probably going to maybe like look him up on the Mr. Olympia page. Uh, what's my favorite fly to tie? Um, I still I still like to tie humpies. You know, that was one of the first flies I learned to tie, you know, that was a real fly when I was a kid. Um, and I still like to tie them. I love to fish them. Um, they're challenging. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I like to tie anything I haven't tied a billion of before. Um, I like anything that's challenging. Uh, at this point in my life, I've tied a lot of a lot of stuff and used a lot of techniques. Um, so any, anything new or, or fresh, um, you know, and that includes my patterns. You know, everything I've got a couple new patterns for next year that I won't tell you about yet. Um, but I've been having a lot of fun tying those kind of experimenting. So um, I'd say it's it's more technique experimentation than pattern so much. But um, I, I sure do like tying humpy still. Um, what flies would I recommend for beginners to tie? Um, well, here, Ian, uh, this is uh, going to wrap right in there. Uh, Pertigons are a pretty easy fly for beginners to tie, but my, my basic fly tying book starts off with brassies and black beauties and then works into RS2s and hare's ears. Um, you know, I think you really have to, when you first start tying, you really have to start at the beginning and work your way through in some semblance of order. You can't just, you know, I have people every day come in the shop and say, 
want to start tying, I fish with a lot of elk hair caddis and parachute atoms. Well, that's not where you start. Um, you got to kind of work your way up to that. It makes it a lot harder if you just start there. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done, but you have a lot of gaps. You didn't start at the beginning. So um, I'd say start with simple simple thread mitch stuff and, and learn the techniques of wrapping the thread and keeping the wraps even and wrapping a rib and um, maybe the basics of dubbing and then kind of build on that, that skill set and kind of work up from there. Um, and uh, yeah, no problem. I'm just glad I was able to work that in there for you, Ian. Um, yeah, and Pertagons actually are not not much different from a thread midge. You know, the uh, um, as many as you, of, of you, as you see on the dang things on on Instagram and every other page, um, you know, they're basically a zebra midge with a tail. So I uh, don't feel like they're they're overly complicated from a beginner standpoint. They uh, uh, are super simple thread body flies with a wire rib. Um, you can fancy them up a little bit, just like you can a regular midge. But uh, it seems to be all the rage these days to tie Pertagons because it's cool. Um, but they're just thread midges with a tail. Um, I know they work. Um, I've seen it. And uh, that's that's sort of how they work. So um, I think Ian Ian fishes a lot of those. I know Russ does. And uh, I don't know. I think that's the the end of my my program. Um, so I don't even know what time it is. I don't have my glasses on. Somewhere around eight thirty. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Sorry about the slow feed. Uh, that had nothing to do with me. That was uh, uh, someone else. Uh, I think it was Russ that did that. And uh, uh, so, so we, we struggled through, we got through it and, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, all this is live on YouTube and we'll be, uh, we'll be posted on YouTube so you can watch it again later. Um, uh, you can go back and hear all about it.